Hi, Charles. Hi, Chelsea Skidmore. Got to check what my name is. I wanted to make sure <laughs> that I had the right font for my pronunciation. I love that. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and for being here. Cheers, Cheers. to you. Mm. Hydration, elation, manifestation, situation. Hi, I'm back. Contemplation. Contemplation, articulation, spiritual renovation. Don't stop. Close that door, please. <laughs> Thank you. Ask them about that. You're you're an original. Well, they say that about twins, but I beg to differ. Were you always this way? <laughs> uh, I used to be this way, and then I went to this way. He needs the keys. He needs the keys to I my think car. So. I and you can tell because instead of like bothering you, it would say, where are the keys? He used this old visual i love it which could be do you have the keys or my arthritis is acting up i'm going to go get an injection of cortisone on my wrist i've always been weird i'm just uh i didn't say it i, I said this way <laughs> well, that way is a zero way no i've always been uh, but you know that's a, an advantage in a business where people want to see something they can't see at home mm -hmm. yes entertainment you mean well, I was thinking more about <laughs> cooking with ice, but either way. Uh, yeah, entertainment. Uh, just uh, presenting something that's uh, going to appeal to somebody. I mean, Salvador Dali uh, was weird, I suppose you could say that, or anybody that's really sparked my soul, mm -hmm. inspired me. I, I think you're very fun and interesting and unique. And it's funny, it's like people throw out all these... When you're a unique person, people throw out all their adjectives of like what they think that you are. And I'm sure like being on the other end of that, it's annoying. Uh, as long as we're getting paid. <laughs> and thank you for not modifying unique. That uh, gets me and people go, it's really unique, right? It's so unique. Hey, dude, unique is unique. You cannot make it more unique by modifying it. Yeah. Well, people are always like, oh, you have such a unique look to me. And then I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? It means they have not very <laughs> much vocabulary. E -R -L -A. Yeah. They need a synonym book. Yeah, or a thesaurus. Thesaurus. That would be it, right? Is it synonym or thesaurus? Well, uh, a thesaurus is a, syn a book of synonyms. What? Okay. So you are a comedian. You're a voice actor. You're a... Well, I'm an actor. Regular. Oh, yeah. Is actor just the correct umbrella? Well, it depends on the people, I guess. People that just do, uh, you know, cartoon voices and things, I don't... I, I would think it would be, but if you're blind, everyone is a voice actor. Mm. And to me, it's just uh, acting. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do more if you're on camera because you can just look at somebody and send a whole paragraph. <laughs> Or order a meal. But if it's just your voice, you have to have that emotive power and needs to be present vocally to suggest some modification. An altercation. Something that changes about the difference between here and there. Or the possibilities for another. I cannot believe what you're saying. It's just your voice, Charles. It's not my voice. It's just his voice. It's not his voice. <laughs> yeah. You must be the most fun grandfather ever. <laughs> uh, I have always maintained that I would present a parenting level that would be unparalleled. Both, <laughs> both to my children and to my grandchildren. I'm finding, you know, as a new mother, it's so exhausting. I've never smiled so much in my life. It's... Uh, you know, how old's your kid? Two months. Oh, my but God. But just with the constant trying to entertain her? Yeah, two months. They're, <laughs> they're still in the pink pet stage, basically. Mm -hmm. know? They're just adorable. And, and I remember just uh, just not going anywhere. Just want to watch them. Just staying there. I don't just, I just want to watch the kid. And, oh, I just, she just rolled over. Like, she looked at me. Oh, she grabbed my finger. 
I know. I love that. And I'm like, oh, my God, now she's starting to grab a little blanket and just to see the process is exciting. Yeah, it's crazy. And just imagine, you know, not obviously uh, in the next year or two, but in some time in the future, you know, she'll be a parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a whole other trip when you besides having the actual grandchildren, seeing your own kids be parents. Mm. It's, it's all part of this whole life thing. I guess tripping getting old, seeing people that they look young and not. And then I was at this party, and I'm walking towards what I thought was the bar area, and I see this old guy that looks familiar coming to me. And I started to walk directly to him, and I realized I was, it was a mirror. <laughs> We met at a party, a small party, small house party. It was a small party. So we met at Marilyn Manson's house. Correct. I remember the night well, because it was the first night I met him. Really? It was you, me, Lindsay, his now wife, and the ATL twins. Oh, yeah. Those kind of like redneck guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What so are they called? ATL? ATL twins. ATL. Yeah. Alt attitude testosterone longevity yes that's what it stands for of course <laughs> so the atl twins yeah and i remember i was just it, i was just taking in so much i mean it was just a weird fucking night a lot of characters going on between all the people who were there and you were just such a trip and then i remember i saw you at the comedy store following that um Oh, but all night you kept making all these weird, you know, you were just like doing your voices. That's what I do. I love it. I just play, you know. Uh, I opened for Manson 1999 in Las Vegas on New Year's Eve. What What did you do to open for Stand him? Stand up. Oh, okay. And that was an unusual gig. Yeah. How did his audience receive that? Which part of the audience? <laughs> there were some parts that were receiving it. Mm -hmm. Other parts were fighting. Other parts were yelling because they'd been waiting a long time and it was a hot day. Mm -hmm. New Year's Eve in Vegas. Wait, and what year was that? 1999, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, so you've known him for a very long time. Yeah. I used to know, uh, you know his parents. Uh, that was one of the the clues to me that of who he was was... Um, the relationship he had with his mother and father. Mm. and uh, How close he was to his dad. And mom. Mm -hmm. And just how loving they were and how uh, just that it was a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's something that's important to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I met his dad at one of his after parties at the Roxy. Oh, my God. Go away. <laughs> Hello? What song is that? <laughs> Manson? <laughs> how did you know? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's my father dad uh, i'll call you back my father died years ago oh i turned the sound off too that's okay it was it was good to see what your ringtone was yeah. you don't know how to turn off your phone oh i did because well, that now is turn, a facebook message i didn't turn it off i turned it down parents don't know how to do sound on their phones oh i, I programmed that <laughs> i wanted to leave it on in case of emergencies oh, okay. and plus that's okay little things like that are fun. And it's like, who? I wonder who'll call him next. <laughs> I love this show. When the people call, that's planned, right? We should have you prank call someone from my phone oh, in one of your voices. Too easy. <laughs> but I used to do that when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. And uh, one of my favorite ones was, uh, I'm, 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 I'm stuck in a snowsuit and I can't, I, I gotta go to the bathroom. I can't, I, 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 do you know what a snowsuit is? Of course, I'm from New York. Okay, well, people who are uh, from this coast may not know. It's a, it's a tire for young children when it's inclement weather, i.e. snow and bad colds. And uh, I tried to get people to come over and um, help me get out of my snowsuit. <laughs> I had to go to the bathroom. That's cute. We, so where did you grow up? Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. And where'd you, did you go to college? I went to Southampton College, Long Island University. Oh. For two years. Started doing acting there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I realized that uh, I'm an actor. I was in uh, the assassination and persecution of Jean Paul Marat, performed by the inmates of the asylum. Uh, I was in uh, a George Bernard Shaw play. I was Captain Blanchley. 
And I did really well. And then I went and auditioned at the Goodman Theater in Chicago. And I got in there, and then I uh, stayed there for two and a half years. And I started doing stand-up while I was in Chicago at uh, folk clubs. They didn't have comedy clubs then. What year was this? 70 to 72 and a half. What, so was I.O. going then, Improv Olympics? Oh, uh, no. Because I know Chicago, the comedy scene was really huge they didn't have and a lot of people clubs. started but okay so then were a lot was that like a big improv scene there though during that time no it was just uh well there was second city oh second city not io sorry yeah second okay. city yeah it was right across the street from uh the earl of old town oh, okay it's a club that i used to perform mm -hmm. in where stevie goodman and john prine uh played and across the street uh, belushi was there and that was great to see. But uh, for clubs, I just worked in these folk clubs, mm -hmm. a place called Ratso's, <laughs> uh, and uh, the Earl of Old Town and Orphans. It's a weird. Uh, for you Chicago people, Aliota Haynes and Jeremiah, huh? <laughs> hey, group. fucking Ratso's. Bonnie Kolak. Anyways, memory works. You know, the memory still works. <laughs> you want to show off. I remember I had an egg and uh, a small sardine. When I was 19 years old, I remember that day perfectly. It was a sunny day. It wasn't, well, it rained later. <laughs> so you were doing plays there? Uh, yeah, and then after uh, after I did that, and then the people at the, at the Goodman Theater weren't exactly pleased that I was doing work outside of the mm -hmm. theater. Oh, they cared that you were doing stand-up as well, well? I don't think they liked it too much. They Why is that? I don't know. Maybe they were a jealous bit. <laughs> Maybe it was uh, they thought it would detract. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but they uh, they said you know they weren't pleased with it. And then I asked Del Close, who mm -hmm. ran Second City, you know what's the best thing to do? Should I like, stay here and try and get with you guys, or go to California? And he said, yeah, go to L.A. And then I came out here, nineteen seventy four. Come to Los Angeles. And then I was checking your Wikipedia page before. And is it true that you made the quote, if you don't remember the 60s? You weren't really there. You made that up? Because I, I, yeah, that's such a popular quote. It's a line that's been associated with other people. But yeah, that was mine. If you can remember the, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't really there. That's amazing. What's the story behind coming up with that and how it evolved into pop uh, culture? I went through the 60s. <laughs> Well, yeah, but where did you say that? Was that something you had said on oh, stage I think I as said a stand-up? Uh, right above me. Here? Yeah. Um, and you could actually even check it. There's because there was somebody writing for a paper who like gave lines of some people, and that was among them. Mm -hmm. And I also streaked right upstairs once. Really? When streaking was a big thing. Wait, fully naked? Yeah. On stage? Uh, on well, I was on stage, and I finished my act, and just. Said, you know, I'm not going to joke about streaking. I just removed all my clothing and left the stage. The comedy store used to be so much more fun. Well, you know, you could say it about <laughs> everything, I guess, but not things that are more fun now. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, things change. It's part of, uh, you know, life. Mammals. You know, mammals, we used to have more fun when there were green mammals. There's no more green mammals. What? What is that? A dinosaur? Well, no, there's, there aren't any green mammals. Oh, okay. No mammals are green. I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, what the I'm fu trying to follow along. You don't need to follow. Just like, I'll pull you or I'll, I'll You'll chase you out from the back. Uh, yeah, mammals aren't green. What about a dinosaur? A dinosaur would be a reptile. Fuck. This is like when I had Ben Stein on, I just could not keep up with anything he was saying. And he just got so frustrated. <laughs> I feel like I'm back in that moment right no, now, not knowing the not, difference between a mammal and a reptile. <laughs> I don't have a Ben Stein attitude, <laughs> but I do have, I love I love knowledge and I love science. Mm -hmm. And mammals are, are live birthers. Uh, I'm listening. Well, reptile, there are some reptiles that have live birth. 20 point question, live birth. <laughs> Name one mammal that has scales, 15 seconds. A mammal that has scales, uh, that would be a pangolin, right? That's correct, a pangolin. 20 point toss up. Igor, pass the kotacha. <laughs> 
So you didn't stick with improv at all? Did you do imp- at Second City? Because you're obviously very excellent at it. No. Uh, well, for me, improv was my act. Yeah. You oh, know? so is that what you, you didn't do material? You just... Well, I would have material that I would go to. Mm-hmm. But when I first went up there, I would like to just wing it. Just like yeah. work off the crowd or just, you know, flow. Mm-hmm. And uh, then at a certain point, get to material. Mm -hmm. And I remember one night I had eaten up the allotted time and I hadn't gotten to any material. Yeah. That was fun. That happens all the time. And now uh, I just, uh, depending what venue and how long you have to do, Mm -hmm. I just like to go. And then at the appropriate moment, uh, oh, that would work nicely here. But the illusion is that it's all made up you know it's theater it's that, right that informed my performing style because of uh, rehearsing and doing theater and using the whole stage and uh i always like to have kind of a theatrical approach mm-hmm. yeah i remember on a sunday night once mitzi it's weird being here because it creates all this comedy store vivage or vibage or yeah or, we love comedy store stories uh, on the and podcast like, she gave me like on a sunday night she gave me like a like a special little showcase and i remember uh hanging up some of my paintings behind me and uh like i had buckets hanging underneath them with uh, uh practice golf balls in them and when certain jokes got a laugh i'd move them over to the other bucket and <laughs> painting would shift and just you know conceptual just behind me uh, yeah, so... I How did she like that? Was she like, what the fuck are you doing? No, she thought it was great. I mean, you know, hey, uh, when I first came here, most people were just monologists. They're just doing jokes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came here with a, a bag of of art, essentially, mm. of things that I'd made, foam rubber sculptures that I'd made, giant heads, and... Um, Something I called a uh, a twirlophone or a siphon, which was uh, there's a picture up there somewhere. It was ping pong balls that had holes in them, attached to uh, a shoelace. So when I would swing it, it would create this whistling sound. Yeah, I called it a biaerial flute or scrotone, uh, which was more visual when you saw the right. <laughs> Uh, and just, uh, you know, visual stuff. And that was already a different approach. When you got to L.A., did point. you come right to the comedy store? Did you go to the improv first? That's a good question. I don't think the improv was here at that point. Okay. So I first just came out on an exploratory mission. And I'm driving down the street, and I see a place called Shelley's Manhole, Bill Cosby. I go, oh, that's a jazz club, Bill Cosby. I pull my yellow rented Volkswagen into the middle of this, no, I pulled into the parking lot. And I go in there and I say, Bill Cosby, I'm Charles Fleischer. And uh, I asked him for advice. Mm. Hey, put something in my drink. <laughs> and then when I woke up three days later, I was just like, could hardly walk. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, he said, go to, uh, go to the comedy store. So I came here. Did he say anything else, advice-wise? No, Yeah, that's pretty much it, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, Rudy DeLuca, who I just saw at the 50-year party, mm-hmm. who was uh, one of the great comedy writers. He was to work with Mel Brooks. Uh, and uh, he was there. And in those days, there wasn't a schedule. This was before Missy had acquired the procedurals. And uh, you just go there and wait to go on. Now? Now, mm-hmm. like, now Mr. Gordon? Now? <laughs> oh, can I go now? You're next, kid. Oh, boy. I'm <laughs> gonna kill him tonight, I swear. While you watch me, I'll show these people why they don't know a joke when they see my joke coming along. I'll tell you something else, too. Um, and then, uh, you know, I went on, and it was it was unexpected. I don't think they were expecting me to be funny. What was, what was your act like then? It was... Uh, Musical instruments that I had made. My uh, tattoo phone, uh, which looked like an abstract trumpet. When I was still in Chicago, I was staying in this place called the Hermit Crown Center. It's like a big dorm. Um, and uh, the upper floors were still in construction, so there were bits of material laying around. And I walked up there and I took some of these pieces of pipe and attached 22 of them together. And then I put my trumpet mouthpiece into it and a funnel on the end, and it was an instrument. 
mm-hmm. which I called the Tutanophone, and then I had the Tatunophone. I did this on laughing too. I used to play uh, shower hoses, <laughs> dueling shower hoses. I used to play the French national anthem on a douche bag. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Had a douche bag with a trumpet mouthpiece in it. You know, I used to uh, do just kind of surreal things. I put on a beard and juggled. And uh, yesterday, while walking through the park, I saw an aluminum bear sitting in a chair that was not there. He stopped, and it was over. And then I'd stop juggling. And then I'd just like play that or say, like, well, I'd just like to see people go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you asked what I did. Those were just. Um, so coming up with those ideas, you're like just like a crazy idea would come to your head and you're like, great, let's try it. Or like, was there any resistance ever against that? Like toying around with it in your head? Like, no, that's stupid. I shouldn't do that. Or were you just fully no. into it and open to like doing whatever? Yeah, I think that's, you know, you can't block things unless they're like heinously wrong mm-hmm. or something but and a lot of the times uh, they would just emerge in the act of performance mm-hmm. and the immediate test is you know did it get a laugh and there's some things that you feel more instinctive about where I didn't get a laugh but maybe the crowd wasn't right or maybe my timing was wrong or maybe if I, I put it too early in the show it should have been a little mm-hmm. later uh, all those things are factors but have to trust but there's a certain point you realize well yeah I like it it's, but it's just not that it's not it's funny not enough to be where it is yeah were you always so open on stage or is that something that over time becoming more comfortable or just from the I start I think so mm-hmm. I think uh, Adam Sandler once told me that uh, I was the most comfortable person he'd ever seen on stage wow that was when I was doing uh, funny people mm-hmm uh, but yeah, I've always just uh, felt that's where I was supposed to be. I mean, I did my first stand up when I was nine years old at summer camp, Camp Kiwani, La Plume, Pennsylvania. And I, uh, I did a bit about a hot dog vendor. <laughs> and there's a guy named Tommy Levine who looked kind of Chinese, and I had him go, I have a yen for a hot dog. And then I used to do Jonathan Winters bits. And uh, then I then I started doing it again when I was in uh, at uh, in college uh, before the Goodman Theater. Mm-hmm. I was um, doing summer stock in the Pocono Mountains. I've been to the Poconos. Yeah, Pocono Playhouse. And uh, at the end of that, I went back to uh, Southampton uh, for the end of the summer where I was going to school and there was a club there and I wanted to try some stand up this you know other than being 9 years old and I had some bits and there was a guy playing guitar before and I uh, talked to him and I I jammed with him on my harp a couple of songs and then I went on and I it was really great mm-hmm. and then the next night I went back and that guy was in there it was a different crowd and it was just the opposite it was not great but they had like uh, bits them like I had uh, uh, an ape doing the weather, a United Nations pill, where you took the pill and go through all these different dialogues. <laughs> Just, you know, things that you're thinking, oh, what can I do? Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's funny. Yeah. And, but that, I don't think that ever stops that process of, of like, you know, yeah, what about that? Yeah, well, you know, when people are fucking, they go, oh, fuck. And when people are eating, they don't go, eat, <laughs> eat. <laughs> you know, some things, uh, you get an idea, and it could be a bit, or it just depends on, you know, how you flesh it out. Or mm-hmm. What's your process? Do you physically write stuff down in a notebook? Uh, I Yeah, I have... Um, well, I'll use my phone mm-hmm. now. I use uh, Evernote. But yeah, I have, uh, if I get an idea, I write it down. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, you go over it and then look at it and then develop it. But I used to always tape my shows, too. A lot of times I wouldn't listen, but in case of something mm-hmm. emerging. And you're more, and you're very physical, so I'm sure it helps to watch back and see what you did there and then. Yeah, and even back in the days, it was a tape, it was just audio. Mm-hmm. Any other crazy stories from the comedy store? Well, let's see. 
there's been a bunch of them. Most of them I can't tell on podcasters. Really? Well, <laughs> out of respect for the okay for the unpod. Oh, um, well, let's see. Uh, my children wouldn't be here more than likely. I mean, there's always an event, but uh, the mother of my children saw me perform here. Hmm, nice. And then uh, a week or so later, I saw at Tower Records, and that was the link. Um, Bob Zemeckis saw me here, and that led to Roger Rabbit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you never know who's going to be somewhere that can take you someplace that you don't belong. Mm -hmm. How did you come to develop the Roger Rabbit voice? Because prior to that, so that movie was in the late 80s, right? 88 it came out. 88. And then before that, obviously, there was just like Looney Tunes, right? Well, there was a whole host of different studios. There was Fleischer Studios, nothing to do with me. Uh-huh. Max and Dave Fleischer, Betty Boop. There was uh, Hanna-Barbera. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, different cartoons, but uh, there wasn't a Roger Rabbit, and there. So the cartoon Looney Tunes didn't exist before that. Is Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the first iteration of? I don't know the history of Bugs Bunny. Oh, it was the first time. Oh yeah, that, that exists. Is the first time that uh, that Warner Brothers and Disney were together on screen. Oh, okay, and that's because of Spielberg's uh, negotiation magical. Yeah. Uh, Wait, now I'm just realizing, is Bugs Bunny and Roger Rabbit the same person? No. Bugs Bunny and Roger Rabbit? Wait, am I? Yes. No. Bugs Why Bunny. am I confusing them? That well, Bugs Bunny is Looney. Oh my God, this whole time, I was thinking that's like the same. I had Who Framed Roger Rabbit, by the way, on VHS growing up. Wow. <laughs> and I remember watching it when I was younger. But Well, uh, uh, Bugs Bunny does not wear pants. Is that the difference? Well, it's one difference. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the difference is, is is what the pants conceal. Oh my God! This whole time, I was thinking it was the same wabbit. No, uh, Roger isn't even insulted because it's like, hey, no, public press is all good. Press. I was born in '87. If this makes a difference, oh, does this well, explain yeah, my behavior? You were just one year old when it came out. <laughs> I remember the the ending scene when they go and there's like the big pot they're like stirring with some like oil in it or whatever. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think that's Macbeth. But no, okay. toad it under cold stone days and night. No, on. not that. No, when they're putting the everyone in in the poison. Oh, in the dip. Yeah. Well, the end is when they're going through the. But they're all in that factory, in right? Wall. Yeah. Yeah. The wall cracks open. And there's Toontown. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 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 That's my. Oh, you're ready. And all, all the tunes are all together. Okay, so that was the first iteration of Roger Rabbit. Well, it, that's the first time people ever saw Roger Rabbit. It, okay. It had been a book, and then they made that into the movie. And you asked me how I manifest the voice, mm -hmm. so. Um, first they just called me to help them audition the Bob Hoskins character because the Metcus had seen me blah 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 and uh, I read with Ed Harris James Wood a bunch of other people and um, after about three of those Bob asked me if I wanted to go to England for four months and, and do this and I said oh I don't know man you know that's, that's a yes. <laughs> did you respond like that? No. That's so funny if you did. Wait, well, that is so good. In the so case, yeah, I did. I did. I said, yeah, you know, well, you know, it's going to cost you. Cost you. <laughs> take my whole clan with me. So uh, <laughs> like any actor preparing for a party, you have the, what's written, you know, mm -hmm. by what they say, their words and actions. In addition to that, I had uh, drawings and eventually an actual animation of what Roger looked like. So the voice had to be created to adapt to that physicality. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then after they got in the job, they told me I had to have a speech impediment because all great cartoons have speech impediments. That is true, huh? It seems. Um, and they put it like a little whistle thing at the end and then I, I came up with the thing of... Uh, <laughs> and they actually videoed me doing that so they could see how to animate. Oh, wow. Roger doing that. 
And then uh, England, four and a half months, my little kids, and uh, I'm going down to the comedy store in England. Mm -hmm. It's not related. To yeah. It's it called the Comedy Square, mm -hmm. Leicester Square, and, and doing well there. And the first time I think they introduced me is, yeah, American. Yeah, and then I come out and, like, it took me five minutes to, like, you know, win them over. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, they don't tell them I'm American. I, they don't need to hate me immediately. <laughs> they don't need to like me or not, but I don't, don't prejudice them with my nationality at this time. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Uh, and I did really well there. It was a lot of fun, too. It was just, uh, it was magical. It was very magical. It was... And, you know, I, I also did, since we're talking about me and uh, the rabbit movie, I was also Benny the Cab and two of the weasels. What were the weasels' voices again? Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> psycho. <laughs> Gonna kill a rabbit. <laughs> and Greasy. <laughs> so then following Who Framed Roger Rabbit, that, that was a big movie when I was a kid. It like was, I remember loving it. Yeah, it's still really popular, yeah. and it's it holds up. It mm -hmm. really does. It's a it's a classic piece of art, uh, you know. And I don't know if it'll ever be eclipsed. Uh, Zemeckis and Richard Williams, who's the head animator. I mean, just you know, a magical bunch of people coming together. So then, following that, you did Nightmare on Elm Street. Was that after that? Or it may have been before that. Oh, okay. I think that was before Roger Rabbit. Yeah, that was when uh, I first met Johnny Depp. Love him when he was just a little cutie. He, I was in my makeup chair, a little cute kid sitting at the end. Johnny Depp was, hey, kid. Amber Alert. That's all I said. <laughs> We he love know, Johnny. He didn't know what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, he's, he's just a beautiful guy. You know, it's super talented, obviously. Mm -hmm. I was like saying, oh, you know, that sunshine is warm. Do you have a preference of acting on screen versus voice acting? Uh, you mean like for cartoons or like, on camera? Or yes. Oh, I prefer to be on camera. Mm -hmm. But uh, Roger Rabbit couldn't have been that way. So, And I've probably gotten more accolades for that. Although um, Zodiac... Mm -hmm. David Fincher, I still get people commenting on, on that scene and that. And years ago, uh, the scene I had in Night Shift, with Henry Winkler and Michael Keaton, and I'd be at a stoplight and someone would pull up and just go, you want to die? <laughs> this is the line from that movie. So I've had an odd career. It's um, been, you know, little sprinkles here and there but uh, weaving in, in and around that I've done a lot of other things that are related to my art and science and inventions mm -hmm. and what inventions I'm just going to open the door while you tell us about these inventions okay I invented fun. a thing that opens doors by the way it's called a knob <laughs> but I didn't register it and that Mr. Knob is really taking it away I'm get... always I'm always sweating now, but well, it's hot in here, right? I think that's also due to the fact that it's 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 warm in here. Yeah, but I also think it has to do with postpartum stuff. Well, I'm not postpartum. I'm like always sweating now. Like I never stop sweating. I think it's healthy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope I'm losing some of that baby weight when I'm you sweating. Kidding me? You'll sweat it off in a minute. <laughs> that's why they call it weight because it takes a while. So, what are these inventions? And then I and then you can show us some of your art too. Okay, I have uh, the first thing I invented and patented was uh, a multicolored crayon that draws rainbows. Ooh. Rainbow. And then I tried to patent my 13 string guitar. That Johnny played? That Johnny Depp played better than anybody. But uh, the guy who wrote the patent was, he messed it up. Hmm. So after that, I invented a device that measures the golden ratio. And uh, what's the golden ratio? Golden ratio is proportion. It's that section to that section to that section. Hmm. It's uh, all throughout nature. A five pointed star is based on the golden ratio. It's dodecahedrons, it, it's everywhere. I might even have a dodecahedron with me, which I'll give to you because wow. it works. It, it, well, that's not a dodecahedron, but it could be. 
Uh, this hair shape right there, that's a dodecahedron. That is uh, based on golden ratio. You just have fun things in your pockets. I bet you have. You know, like, you're a, a whole... married woman with children. <laughs> I'm a grandpa, and you can't talk to a fella like that. <laughs> Why well, I have fun things in my pocket, but we're not going there, lady. Not today. Not on a heaty day like this way. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. Um, I originally came up with it because I wanted the faces that I drew to be better, and so. I, I developed this device that you could put on a picture of someone and then align it to the eyes and then transfer it over and get exactly where the placement of the features would be. Hmm. Um, and uh, that was the last thing that I patented, my uh, golden ratio device called Ziz. And if you, uh, I have a big one, so I mean the device. <laughs> It's warm in here, isn't it? <laughs> Is it hot in here, no. Lars? Could you turn off the air conditioner, please? I don't have no conditioner up here. It's alive. Whoo! It's warmer than a rainbow. It's loggy. If you uh, extend the, the Ziz, the golden ratio device, to be equal to the top of your head, the first break in it will be right at your navel. The navel occurs at a golden ratio point in people's bodies. Wow. And so probably the square root of five plus one divided by two for you little math monkeys out there. Square root of five divided by one plus two, one point six one eight. See? Beautiful stuff. I love numbers. Mathematics. You can't lose with them. They're everywhere. Seven. <laughs> we all win. High brows for the low lifes. Let's see these pictures that you've made. Well this Paintings is Paintings or drawings? Both. Okay. Uh this is uh, these are on my website charles dash Fleischer dot com. Ooh, let's see, let's see trippy. That. Trippy. It's all kind of crazy shit in there too. That's that one there. Yeah. Very cool. Yes, ma'am. I got this one here. Charles dash Fleischer dot com. You can see these live on your own computer. Ooh, screen. I like that. It's called Ten Tiny Elephants. My titles are all varied and usually don't have anything to do with it. Although this one is called Museum of Self-Reflection. Beautiful. It took over three years. Every painting in the museum is of the museum at another time, and the paintings in the paintings have paintings on the walls. Oh, wow. So it took over three years. Very cool. This one's called Strange Family. <laughs> Who's that boy? Well. It's you? No, it's not really me, but <laughs> a lot of times when I'm just drawing out of my head, the faces sometimes resemble me. No, that's just... Uh, just a face that came out of my myself. Uh, Self-portrait. And that one and that one. And then, see, there's the egg down there. What's the deal? Huh. Uh, whose family is it? And there's uh, That's an alien kind of creature. Yeah, I'm trying. bird. In yeah, but very. The left one's very interesting. This guy? I'm trying to figure out that one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love aliens. They're Do you, you believe in aliens? Have you ever had a UFO experience? Besides this? Yes. Just coming over here. Uh, no, never had. Everything was always identified in my experience. <laughs> I've, uh, I just always had a, I, I dreamt I met a 30,000 year old alien once. And he What said, did he want? He said, come on, let's go. And I said, no, I got more stuff to do. And he said, okay, I'll come back. And then within the dream, I was telling people in the dream, like, wow, this just happened. This is really cool. Uh, but sometimes I dream that I'm dreaming. Like the other night I dreamt that uh, my father was there and my father died a mm -hmm. while ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I but you're dead. So this is a dream. So, oh, I, I hope you don't mind, but I had my wax people come in. Yeah. I wanted them to do the floors up there. <laughs> Thank they you. They were spotty. It's not going to pick it up. They're spotty. This is a... Uh, That's wild. Oh, my analog. Yeah, it's done... Uh, no oh, the little dinosaur is so cute. Oh, you see the dinosaur and there's a little horse and there's all kind of little stuff in there. I like the stuff that when you continue to look at it, you'll see. You see things. more and more. Yeah. Yeah, this one has a lot of that in it too. This is uh, migration patterns of mythological animals. There's a lot of weird detail in that. And this here is from my red chair series. You can see there's a red chair. Beautiful. Right there. I have a whole series of paintings and on the website charles dash you don't have to buy anything just, just look that's all um I, there's a whole thing where you can categorize and you can just go through the red chair series and that's there right there so 
And did you have any, did you take art classes or did you just kind of no, find I it? No, I did. I just always uh, wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would try and teach myself stuff. And, I, you know, I, I have a sketchbook that I'm always trying to, like, uh, you know, find something new, find a new kind of style, some new little trick or angle, something good. You know, it's like, ooh, what about that? Yeah, that. Hey, you can't see that. Wow. Yeah. Very Anyways, cool. Um, Very talented all around. I have a need to express myself visually. Did anyone pay attention to you growing up? The police. <laughs> Did you get in trouble a lot growing up? No, I was just very needy and yeah. hung around the officers. Uh, no, um, I don't think... Uh, uh, lack of attention would always equate to being creative to get attention. Totally. Uh, but it could. There could be a correlation there. But I had uh, amazing parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, my mother was uh, just uh, an extraordinary woman. You know, my dad, they're both so mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. My dad was more of like a street gambler kind of guy. Ooh. And my mother graduated college when she was 19. Mm-hmm. Wow, so that's impressive. She was a very impressive woman. Were they from the East Coast as well? Yeah. My what mom, nationality are you? Me? Yeah. I'm Hindu Vazanovian. What? Not what? <laughs> Hindu Vazanovian. What nationality? I'm American. You mean my where, yes. where in Europe my people come from? Yes. Well, how far back you want to go? Back to Africa? Just your parents. Okay, well, <laughs> my, well done. <laughs> that's fun, Don. I need another dodecahedron. Uh... Let's see. My parents were born here. My family goes back to the Civil War here. But as far as the European countries, France and Germany. Mm, okay. And I, I, I will often say to myself when no one else is listening and I need attention my own way, I say that uh, my German part of my brain is, you know, my watchmaker brain. It is the scientist, the empirical data. And the French is the, you know, the poet, the artist. Mm. And that combination, the bringing together of my left and right lobe across the myelinated tissue to connect the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum. Google it, motherfucker. <laughs> Did you do work to study accents, or is it just by ear and like what you felt like they were? Um, yes and yes. See, I have a theory about that. Um, if you try to uh, swallow and breathe right now, you can't. But your kid can. Because to suckle mama milk, you got to be able to mm -hmm. swallow and breathe simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But there's a cutoff mechanism for that. Age-wise? Yeah. Interesting. Uh, when your kids are no longer breastfeeding, they don't have to do that. Right. So uh, if you'd been born in England, you'd talk with, the, with an English accent. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I hypothesize that there's a, a vocal imprint cutoff switch. So, you know, normally you take a vocal imprint and that's the way you talk, depending on where you're born, right? Mm -hmm. But some people, actors, per, perhaps actors, they have uh, that imprints so where it never gets cut off. Mm. They can hear something and take that imprint and then just like push it on down. Mm -hmm. That's a theory. That makes sense. It does. Good theories make sense, and successful theories make money. Do I need a <laughs> Do I need to make an amends for my comment asking if you got attention growing up? Not at all. Was that offensive? Are you kidding me? It was not connected to if talent, but then when you answered that, I felt the, really bad. Not at all. If you were to put paper clips on my testicle, <laughs> testicle. Would you like it? Uh, I would not, but I would not be offended. <laughs> Clothespins. No, I'm not, I'm not uh, associating a metal <laughs> and scrotum. It doesn't work for me. I like a, a free scrotal flab. Um, but as far as offending me uh, with just words or something, you can't offend me because... Uh, you know, it's when somebody says something you don't like, and you know, it it reflects on them, mm. not you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very uh, true. Uh, one of the four agreements. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you follow that? Uh, I don't like read it every day, mm -hmm. but I know it, and I think it's good advice. It, yeah, don't take things personally is the most difficult. Mm -hmm. But always doing your best, and you know, be true to your word, and uh, don't assume, and don't take things personally. That's like hey, that makes sense. You know, yeah, I can see that. It seems like pretty easy for you to just like you don't seem very emotionally tortured. It seemed like what? Like you seem like a very open 
positive, like just go with it kind of person. Like you, you don't seem like you're in your head about things. Um, I'm feel. I feel line. <laughs> I feel very blessed. I feel very blessed. <laughs> to, what is it again? They changed it four times. Just show it to me. <laughs> Can you do that again? Thanks. I feel really blessed that I that I'm just uh, fuck. I forget. I'm just gonna go wing it. Uh, <laughs> I just uh, I'm just I'm just happy to be here. Yeah. You know, it's. Uh, I think maybe it's because. I have a certain perception that allows me to see essentially the magic of reality. Mm -hmm. Is this something you have to work on or are you just this way? Because I'm very impressed, whatever it is. Well, I think like everything, it's a combination. I mean, you know, you have something, but, uh, you know, like you can really play guitar well or something. But, you know, if you don't ever do it, you're not going to get mm -hmm. it. Or maybe even more abstract, that you could be a great chess player, but if you never get a chess board... You're never even going to know. So you have to start somewhere. Yeah, you have to start and, and find out and make a connection and see that. But seeing just the, like, how crazy and imagination rich. I mean, we the world, the like, animal has to go out and kill something to stay alive. And we eat sunlight. All energy comes from the sun. Plants... They uh, trans. They put it into another file format, essentially, so you can eat that, or an animal can eat it, and you can eat that animal, download it from there. I mean, that's like that's crazy. Who thought of this? You got to kill something, and then like, well, how do you are you? How did the little baby? How did we, how did I get here? Well, your father shoots some goo out of his pee hole and puts it into your mama's pee hole, and then you grow. Now, come on, don't fuck with me. You know? <laughs> Tell me what it is, really. I'm not stupid. That's fucking stupid. That's like, yeah, goo from a pee hole. And I just happened to make a human being. Come on. And then your kids are born and they know how to, they know how to suckle, they know how to eat, they don't know how to walk or talk yet. But snakes can crawl. I mean, the whole thing is just uh, so abundant with magic mm -hmm. that if you can participate that in any level, from my point of view, it's like, this is like, wow, thank you. So what you're saying is like there's so much, everything is so much bigger than that. Yeah, everything's so much is bigger. That, and we're all is that what you're saying? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think you see, I, I see the one hour. What Charles is saying is like, shit is fucking crazy. Break it down for <laughs> me. <laughs> shit is crazy, man. It's bigger than your head. <laughs> thank you. Chelsea on that one. Yeah, that's it. It's bigger and we're all, we're a part of it all. We're all part of the whole deal. Mm -hmm. So, um, is that why you're so into space? Because it just makes you realize how big the world is? It's just because it's something that I want to know about. Mm -hmm. I have made a discovery uh, concerning something called gamma ray bursts. Uh, if you go to my Wikipedia page, there's a link at the bottom. Or my website, there's a link and a little description of uh, gamma ray bursts. They're the largest display of energy in the known universe. And they take place uh, all over the universe. You can see a map when they occur because we have dates when they occur. And they're supposed to be random. I found a mathematical theorem that establishes that they're not random. And mm -hmm. I wrote a paper. To get on the Cornell University website, you have to be uh, approved. Someone has to sponsor your your uh, your paper. And I found the scientist, an astrophysicist, who did that. So my paper's up there. Wow. And uh, it's amazing. And my my theory is, uh, well, the first part of the theory is they're not random. The second part, which I can't prove, is what they are, and I think they are a form of communication from advanced beings from another time. I mean, it could be just some like space worm farting, but if you picture like an egg-shaped ellipse, which would be a, a, a map of, of the known universe, and then there's a dot here. That uh, gamma ray burst took place Thursday, the following Friday one there, then uh, Saturday down there. So I would connect sequential bursts with straight lines in groups of eight. And then I would look at the angles created by connecting them to see what whether they were what size they were, and um, they consistently skewed to smaller angles, and um, that led to the proof that um, that they weren't random. So, uh, you know, it could be like I say, some space worm farting. But it's definitely uh, interesting to look at and to wonder. Mm -hmm. So are you studying the 
sky frequently, well, seeing what you can find? I don't do it like with my own optical blinks, <laughs> but I do look at the, at the data that comes in. And uh, I found somebody last year uh, who's helping me program a lot of this stuff into a Python mm-hmm. so that I can uh, see it so the computer does it because initially I did everything by hand. Just wow. Drawing, yeah. You know, tracing it on the screen. And yes. And so you have like one of those big screens where you can do that? Well, I don't. Uh-huh. Uh, you can go to a school and do it? Uh, no, it's just, it's all on the internet. Oh. All the data is there. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, I just uh, look at that and try and find correlations and and new data. And if it is indeed what I think, then what does that mean and what are they saying and what information is there? And, uh, you know, we send out radio waves to try and communicate. And radio waves are the low end of the spectrum. You know, uh, gamma gamma rays and gamma bursts even are way at the, the opposite end. So it's uh, a more efficient w- medium to use. And uh, why wouldn't somebody figure out something and send something? And it wouldn't be something that's known yet. You know, he could be right, Chelsea. Well, <laughs> he could not, but either way, it, it's good podcasting. And it's very interesting, nonetheless. Well, interesting to the interested. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of times it's like, whatever, dude, okay, like space space explosions, okay? Like, I have a, something to do. Space, gamma ray bursts, fuck off. You know, okay, though, you gotta, gotta roll with it, you know? I love it. Well, Charles, thank you. Thank you very much. This, this like, Two hours flew by. (laughs) I appreciate you coming on. Do you want to end with a quick um, little voiceover reel? (laughs) Dance monkey dance. (laughs) Dance voiceover reel? Uh, How how real do you want it to be? (laughs) How about a voiceover fake? A a, A bunch of little fun sound bites. I first met Chelsea Skidmore when I was 15 years old. She was inside of a glass elevator drinking a margarita. It was not a margarita. It was a tequila. No de brado sniff taking pronto. Be salakator to them. Whenever there is someone that you love, give them a kiss and then do it again. Thank you. Okay, that was a good rehearsal. <laughs> Let's shoot this from Put some film in that tape there, Fed Row. Let's make some fucking history here, you little blam dog. Shabakabooga. <laughs> and we're out. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Please give Chelsea a dirty key and have a selected painting. Okay. <laughs>